material culture. It sounds fancy, right? But it's actually a pretty straightforward concept. Material culture is the idea that we can study people based on the objects that they use. For example, think about some of the objects we use on an everyday basis right now in 2021. Cell phones, cars, coffee pots, computers, recliners, mugs, and, and yes, hand sanitizer, masks, Lysol wipe, you know, 2021 stuff. On the surface, these objects may appear mundane and uninteresting, but that's because we use them day in and day out and don't appreciate their broader significance. Objects provide insights into the culture and time period which they are being used in. So if we just take a step back for a moment and remove our personal connections to these objects, then we can begin to really see that they provide a nice snapshot and representation of this particular moment in time. Material culture is particularly useful to historians because it can be used as a method for investigating the past. This method is especially useful when studying groups of people who left behind a thin or non-existent paper trail. Sure, we can learn about the experiences of, you know, let's say a Civil War soldier by reading the letters they wrote home, their diary, or maybe a memoir they published after the fact. But what about illiterate soldiers who could not read or write? Well, they used objects, right? We can learn about the experiences of a common Civil War soldier by studying the objects they carried with them, like their weapons, their uniforms, and their eating utensils. So, okay, I know what you're thinking. What's an archivist like myself talking about objects for anyways? When we think of historic objects, we tend to think of museums and curators, right? Museums have artifacts and archives have records. So surely you can't study material culture at an archive. Well, actually you can. And in fact, you can get some real insight into a wide range of the population by studying material culture in an archive. Now, the Chester County Archives is a government archive, meaning we exclusively preserve records directly produced by or filed with the Chester County government. And luckily, there are a number of different types of government records in our collections that list objects and material possessions of ordinary folks like you and I. So you might not be able to see or touch these objects like you would if they were in a museum, but you can associate the object with a specific person and a specific moment in that person's life. So with that said, let's dive in and take a look at a few of these records. Let's start with the most common, estate inventories. Traditionally, when a person died, there was a lot of legal steps taken to determine what happened to their property. Let's say, for example, a woman died in Vincent Township with 100 acres of land and a large dwelling house filled with stuff. What would happen to all of her personal belongings? Determining what happened to her property, who inherited it, and who paid certain fees and taxes is referred to as the probate process. You're probably familiar with a will or even an administration bond, but more often than not, inventorying the decedent's estate was also part of the probate process. An estate inventory includes a list of the personal property owned by the decedent at the time of their death, and we can get a real clue into the person's life by analyzing what type of material possessions were included in their estate inventory. Let's take a look at this inventory filed in Westtown Township in 1768. It was part of the estate file for a woman named Bella. This is actually a pretty significant record because Bella was the first identified African-American woman in Chester County with an estate file. This source would be especially useful for a historian curious about black social life in colonial Chester County. So what type of objects did Bella own? Well, according to her inventory, she had some pretty standard household items like linen sheets, tablecloths, two snuff bottles, blankets, pots and kettles, and a spinning wheel, just to name a few. There's one particularly interesting entry in this inventory, and that is this note for six books. Because Bella owned six books, we can assume she was literate, which is really interesting because if you look at her will, she does not sign it with her signature. Rather, she signs it with her mark. So if we were just looking at Bella's will, then we might assume she was not able to read or write. But because we know what type of object she owned, including the six books, 
we can now assume she was, in fact, literate. Signing a legal document with a mark, just as Bella did, did not necessarily mean an individual was illiterate. Just like today, people start thinking about writing a will and signing what happens to their state at an older age. Many people, presumably like Bella, often signed their will with a mark instead of a signature because they were either too sick, infirm, or had difficulty seeing. Now John Hickman is on the extreme opposite end of the spectrum because he was a wealthy and educated gentleman living in Chester County during the 19th century, and his 1875 inventory is a doozy. It's 24 pages long. John Hickman had a massive inventory, and that makes sense because he was a true Renaissance man who studied medicine, law, and classical studies before being elected to the United States House of Representatives in 1855. What's really interesting about the Hickman inventory is it includes a list of the books in his library. So how cool is that? We can see the books that John Hickman would have read that likely informed his decisions as a policymaker in the 1850s and 1860s. You know, just a typical time in American history when significantly consequential legislation wasn't being passed or anything. So what was John Hickman reading? Histories of England, different poems and fables, books on ancient Rome, various dictionaries and encyclopedias, books of secret societies, and even the Quran. The extensive inventory of library books shows John Hickman was clearly a thoughtful and educated man. And he also has some pretty cool library decorations like a shark's head. Plain and simple, John Hickman was a pretty cool dude. But come on, just look at him. You didn't need his inventory to tell you that. Now here's another estate inventory from Chester County filed in 1786. It lists the goods and chattels of Cuff King of Middletown Township. This is another unique inventory because Cuff King was actually a former enslaved person. In his will, Cuff King notes he was manumitted by Peter Worrell three years before Worrell's death in 1772. So what material possessions did a formerly enslaved free black man own in Chester County in 1786? Well, Cuff King owned some fairly standard items, like hardened paper money on hand, wearing apparel, and tools like an axe, sickle, gun, powder horn, and a knife. Now what's even more interesting is the fact that his sister, Jane Salmon, also filed an estate inventory. Jane's will mentions that she was also formerly enslaved by Peter Worrell, and her inventory includes items like household furniture, gowns, quilts, handkerchiefs, and interestingly, a legacy left by her brother Cuff King. Now, neither Cuff King or Jane Salmon's estate inventories are that remarkable in and of themselves. And I've got to be honest with you, I see a lot of researchers come into our reading room to look at estate inventories, and rarely is anyone absolutely blown away by what they see. But even if the inventories do not have anything remarkable listed, like a shark's head in the case of John Hickman, the inventories are still useful because the objects they list help humanize the individual. To most of us, Cuff King and Jane Salmon are just names, but when we see the types of objects they owned, we get a little glimpse into their identity and the type of people they were. And this is really important when we consider that both Cuff King and Jane Salmon personally experienced the horrors of slavery firsthand. One of the cruelest aspects of that dark institution was its emphasis on dehumanizing the individual. Just the term slave strips away the basic humanity and agency of people like Cuff King and Jane Salmon. But because we can see the objects these two owned, we can imagine how they would have used the objects. King's objects show us that he likely knew how to do things like hunt, cut down trees, and farm. Fairly obvious things most people back then would have needed to know to survive, but now we can start to see Cuff King and Jane Salmon not just as simple names, but as real people doing real things with real life experiences. Now sometimes we can use these estate inventories to explore the occupation of an individual. Look at this 1732 inventory of Robert Johnson from New Garden Township. Looks pretty standard, right? With traditional objects like wearing apparel, household items, and farming equipment. Look further, however, and we see glassmaking tools. Most colonial families in Chester County did not own glassmaking equipment like Robert Johnson, so we can assume Johnson was a glassmaker using this trade for income. Here's the 1799 inventory for James Guthrie of Brandywine Township. 
Look at some of the items listed in his inventory, like various hoghead barrels, kegs, and other storage containers for large quantities of alcohol. If this was the only record we were looking at relating to James Guthrie, we might wonder why he had all these barrels and kegs. But because we have other records like taxes and petitions, we know James Guthrie was a tavern keeper who operated the Sign of the Ship Tavern in the village of modern-day Guthriesville in East Brandywine Township. So to reiterate, we can get a good sense of the identity of an individual by looking at the material objects they owned. And for much of Cheshire County's history, a person's occupation was a significant factor in one's identity. A colonial farmer lived a much different life than a merchant. A 19th century blacksmith living in Coventry Township had different life experiences than a gentleman or gentlewoman living in Westchester. Because these groups had different occupations and life experiences, the objects they owned would have been different. And we can see those differences in archival records like estate inventories. Now, estate inventories are certainly not the only type of record we have which can be used to study material culture. Another type of probate record is a vendue list. Let's say, for example, someone died with a lot of debt. Well, the decedent's estate assumed the responsibility of that debt. Oftentimes, a public sale was held to raise the revenue to repay the decedent's debt, and all the goods and personal property of the decedent that was sold would be recorded on the vendue list. So the vendue list is similar in nature to the estate inventories, but they have an added layer. Not only do they list items formerly owned by the decedent, but they also list who purchased the item at public sale. This may be really valuable to genealogists looking for clues into family relations. Now, Sarah Vanderslice of Schuylkill Township died in January 1836, and the estimated value of her estate did not cover the debt she owed, so her estate held a public sale in March. A vendue list was filed, and it lists all the items once owned by Vanderslice, along with the highest bidder for that particular item. The names that appear on this list were likely the relatives and neighbors of the decedent. The name William Vanderslice, for instance, might be a potential lead for genealogists searching for relatives of Sarah Vanderslice. Now, take note of some of the items listed in the public sale. A cow, hay, straw, a wagon, oats, and corn. Compare these items with those listed in the vendue list of Mary Park of Westchester just two years later in 1838. Mary Park's estate includes items like tumblers and wine glasses, lamps, tea canisters, and a paper box. These two women, Sarah Vanderslice and Mary Park, lived during the same period in time in the same county, but based on the items sold at public sale and recorded with the vendue list, we know they lived quite different lifestyles. The inventory of Vanderslice of Schuylkill was that of a typical farming household while Parks resembled more of an upper or middle-class town dweller. Now with all this said, we need to remember that both a vendue list and a state inventory entail a certain level of wealth. As we discussed, both these records are part of a broader probate process, or the process of settling estates. Therefore, when we talk about estates and wills and inventories and vendue lists, we need to recognize that these people had enough money land, and valuables to necessitate such a process. Just like today, the overwhelming majority of people have historically not written wills because they did not own enough property, valuables, or wealth to warrant a probate process. More often than not, when a person died, their family and friends simply settle things amongst themselves without legal proceedings. So another series of records that also lists material objects is the collection of insolvent debtors' petitions. There has traditionally been a civil process in place to assist debtors who did not have the means to repay their creditors. The insolvent debtor could file a petition with the Court of Common Pleas asking to be relieved from further liabilities. In addition to listing their creditors, the amount of debt they owed, and the reason for their insolvency, the petitioner was also required to list all their property. Check out this insolvent debtor petition submitted by Ruth Cloud in 1730. Cloud was actually thrown into prison, not because she personally accumulated a large debt, but because her late husband, Joseph Cloud, owed a significant sum of money, so his creditors came after her for the money that her husband had owed. 
Now, most of us can relate to some form of debt and the anxiety it can cause, whether it's credit card debt, medical debt, student loans, or car payment. Those monthly payments can cause a lot of financial stress, but at least we don't have to worry about going to prison under an insolvent debtor's law, a law that was enforced in Pennsylvania well into the mid-19th century. Ruth Cloud was held in prison for six months before petitioning the Court of Common Pleas. She listed the property that she owned, including four horses, an iron pot, two spinning wheels, two beds and bedding, four pigs, and a few old things tossed about the house of no value. Similarly, in 1841, Alan Youngblood, who was disposed to frolic about too much, also filed an insolvent debtor's petition and listed his personal property. Like many of the other inventories we looked at thus far, the items Youngblood listed are pretty unremarkable, just standard household items. But these items provide a personal insight into 19th century poverty. Poverty in early America is a historical subject we can study, right? But we must remember it was a real, lived experience for folks like Alan Youngblood. History is about understanding human experiences, and if we want to know more about poverty in early American history as a historical subject, we need to look at how people experienced that, and this inventory of the very bare essentials reveal how poverty personally impacted Alan Youngblood and the material possessions that he could afford. This series of insolvent debtors' petitions is a nice representation of the working class in Chester County. You would think because these individuals are often sitting in prison for their inability to repay their creditors, that they would be the poorest of the poor. But that's actually not exactly true. Consider the way you and I apply for credit today. We have to prove that we can be trusted to repay that credit, right? With credit scores and proof of income, we have to jump through multiple hurdles to prove that we can be trusted with that new line of credit. Well, that was also similar for these individuals. It's unlikely creditors would give paupers or residents of the county poorhouse credit because they did not have a strong financial track record. Instead, creditors often worked with people like laborers or tradesmen who could be better trusted to repay their debts. But just like today, sometimes folks simply experienced tough financial situations that made them default on their credit. Such was the case in 1842 when Benjamin Cox submitted an insolvent debtor's petition stating that the main cause of his insolvency was the loss on a horse of about $100 and some $26 on work done, and that his wife and children to support required more than he was able to earn to support his debts. Because we know Benjamin Cox owned shoemaking tools, it's safe to say he was a member of the working class who simply had some tough luck that we all can relate to. So okay, the last record that we're going to look at today is the 1782 Register of Damages caused by the British Army during the American Revolutionary War. And if you're familiar with our 1777 Chester County Property Atlas, then you know we relied heavily on this record to denote properties plundered by the British Army during the Philadelphia Campaign as General Howe's forces marched across Chester County in route to capture the rebel capital. When representatives from the 13 American colonies met in Paris in 1782 to negotiate the peace terms to end the war, they brought with them a detailed register of damages caused by the British Army without compensation. This was a method the colonies used to shame the British government into better peace terms. Check out this account of damages submitted by Anne Morton of Ridley Township. Anne was actually the widow of John Morton, Chester County's lone signer of the Declaration of Independence, who died in April of 1777. Among the items the British reportedly stole from the Morton estate without compensation included wearing apparel such as broadcoats, breeches, jackets, a suit, cloaks, buttons, and some buckles. Now sure, these aren't necessarily the most expensive or valuable items, but to Anne Morton, they were personal, physical mementos to her late husband who had just died a few months earlier. So when we talk about the personal, emotional toll the Revolutionary War had on the civilian population, 
we can get a good sense of this by looking at Anne Morin, whose husband was a leading figure among the American revolutionaries. But to Anne, he, he was more than that. He was a loving husband, a friend, a father to their children. The British did not just steal wearing apparel from the Morton estate. They stole material reminders of a loving family member. Now, a lot of Chester County residents reported that the British simply stole farm animals, like Tristram Moore of West Marlboro, who reported the British forces stole a dark bay stallion, which was put in Jacob James's company of light dragoons. Others reported more valuable objects, like Thomas Lewis, whose account included two watches. Jesse Graves of Birmingham Township had a really interesting account, and we actually created an entire video based around the depredation claim that he reported. You see, Graves submitted a massive list of items stolen by the British Army. The total value of Graves' damage claim was 212 pounds. That's an incredibly large and expensive list of damages, which is certainly unusual for a typical Chester County family of the day. Sure, the animals make sense, the farm tools and crops, no problems there. But all the clothing and large quantities of household items? These elements raise questions because the inventory is indicative not of a typical farming family, but rather a family operating a general store. So because we were able to see the material possessions owned by this family, we began to ask questions and went down this really interesting rabbit hole. And ultimately, we argued that the Graves, they were operating a general store from their Birmingham Township home. You can learn more about this family by checking out that video we made that's on our YouTube channel. Now, there are other records we could highlight like assigned estates, mechanics liens, and tax records, but we think you get the idea. Material culture is not limited to museums, but can be studied effectively using archival government records. And we think this is really important because, as we've shown, archival records list a wide array of items, ranging from simple pewter spoons to a valuable shark's head. So while you can't physically see or intimately analyze these objects like you would if they were on display in museums, we think archival records have the ability to offer a wider material representation of the past covering a broader snapshot of the population. Archives are filled with stories of our shared humanity. But unfortunately, a lot of times when we're doing research, we get too focused about worrying about the exact names and dates and places that we often overlook those stories. The objects listed in the records that we highlighted today can remind us that our historical subjects, whether that's an ancestor or simply an interesting figure, they were real people. Their personal belongings reflected their interests, skills, occupations, and wealth. But they also provide a glimpse into the world they lived and the era which they belonged to. Names, dates, and places tell a pretty bland story. But if we dig a little deeper, we can add dimension to their story that's a little bit more colorful and a little bit more meaningful.